join me in welcoming Lance Hosey to our school. That's very nice. I'm pretty sure the introduction will end up being longer than the lecture. Uh, I'm going to jump right in because I have far too many slides and I tend to be kind of chatty. Uh, as Juan mentioned, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer with RTKL. We do a lot of work all over the world of various scales and types. Uh, we are, I think, the sixth largest architecture in the firm uh, in the world right now. We have a dozen offices on four continents and a thousand people. Um, so, and I mentioned this just to give you an idea of who RTKL is, but also to say that one of the things we've tried to do since I joined two years ago is create a culture that is tilting towards what I call an ecosystem of innovation. You don't think of large firms as having an advantage other than revenue, but uh, what we're trying to do is this, is take advantage of the power of many. Now we think, uh, there's, this is going to be a thread throughout the talk. In the design industry, we tend to value creativity and, and innovation from the individual. We hold up individuals as, as visionaries. And yet, if you look outside of architecture, companies like Google, what they find is innovation is actually stimulated more by crowdsourcing, by collaboration. This is my favorite quote on collaboration. Good ideas come from anywhere, so the more voices, the better. If you think about that, then a thousand person firm is theoretically a thousand times stronger than a single practitioner. So we're trying to tap into that, but it only works if we behave very differently than a single practitioner. How do we share knowledge? How do we work together differently? So um, now, over the last couple of years, we've worked hard to try to change how we're doing things, and we're starting to get recognized for that. We've been on a bunch of recent lists for top sustainable design firms. What I'm here to talk about is my book, which Juan mentioned, it's The Shape of Green. It came out two years ago, as far as I know, it's still the only book dedicated to the relationships between sustainability and beauty, or the aesthetics of sustainable design. Now, why is that important? So, uh, a couple of decades ago, when I first heard about sustainable design, the first question I ask is, what does it look like? And the answer was, that's a stupid question. And so I stopped asking it for a while, but I kept wondering it, and after a while I realized not only is it not a stupid question, it's an extremely important question, but I didn't see anybody trying to answer it. So I set out to write the book a handful of years ago just because I thought somebody needed to wrestle with that question, and this is the result. And the core question of the book is, does sustainability change the face of design or only its content? So when you mention sustainability to people, whether they're in the design industry or not, they tend to think of solar panels and wind turbines as if it's all about technology, rather than the experience of something. So a lot of what I'm here to talk about is to dispel those misperceptions. Now, conventional wisdom in the design industry is really clear about uh, answering this question. Here's Peter Eisenman. Sustainability has nothing to do with architecture. Raphael Vignoli, who was my first employer out of school, says sustainability has, or should have, no relationship to style. Not only does it occasionally, or usually, not have a connection to what a building looks like, it shouldn't. So some of the most celebrated designers practicing today have either completely dismissed the whole agenda of sustainability, or they're saying that it's completely irrelevant, right? Finally, the American Prospect Magazine asked whether well-designed de green architecture is an oxymoron, meaning that it's not just occasionally ugly, it's inevitably ugly, as if somehow embracing the principles of sustainability leads to hideousness, right? So why is that? Um, there are plenty of examples like this. This was on the cover of a couple of books recently about green homes, and it's attractive, right? There are plenty of examples of attractive architecture that also performs in the ways that we conventionally call sustainably. Yet, in this case, uh, I wrote the introduction to the one on the right, so I'm a little bit complicit in this and holding up buildings like this. But what makes this look good has nothing to do with what makes it green. It performs well because of its mechanical system and its material selection, but it looks like the Farnsworth house. To me, raise your hand, I know a lot of you are very young, you know the Farnsworth house, Mies van der Rohe, so it's one of the iconic mid-century houses, right? You don't think of Mies van der Rohe as being a green architect, so why is this green, right? So the reason why sustainability can occasionally be unattractive is because we don't think of attractiveness as essential to sustainability. So my book and this talk is about how 
not only can we bridge the gap between what we call sustainability and what we call beauty, we have to in order to break through and go beyond just the sort of basic practice of it. In other words, there is a relationship between art and science, but not just within the design industry, within all of culture, we think of them as different things. They occupy different sides of the brain. One is in the left side, one is in the right side. Part of it is in universities and in high schools, we're taught that, oh, I'm good in math and science or English and art, but not both, right? We're taught that they somehow are completely different pursuits. So uh, now, the architecture is maybe one of the worst industries for perpetuating that myth. About four years ago, Vanity Fair did a cover story where they, they uh, polled 50 of the world's leading architects, everybody you've ever heard of, and asked them <coughs> what the most important buildings from the last 30 years were. And here were the results. Let me see if I can get this to work without poking anybody's eye out. So the top winner by far was Frank Gehry's Guggenheim in Bilbao, Spain. It got something like three times the number of votes of any other building. So it seemed to be that there was consens consensus among the architectural elite, elite about what an important building is today. But a number of people observed there was a conspicuous lack of exemplary green architecture. There are a couple of architects in here, Renzo Piano and Norman Foster, whose work today is considered to be high performance. But the buildings that show up on this list are much older and not nearly as environmentally ambitious. So there's not really anything on here that the green building community would hold up as a great example of this. So to test this, I had this column in Architect Magazine that Juan mentioned. So I did my own poll and I, I reached out to 50 leading green building experts and asked them what the most important green building of the last 30 years were. And the differences were remarkable. So I called this, whoops, I called this the A-list and this the G list. There's not a single building on both lists. In fact, there's not a single building in the entire list of something like 50 nominations in the first list that shows up anywhere in the winners on the second. There's not a single American architect who shows up on both lists. The two architects who do, Foster and Piano, as I said, uh, Vanity Fair, the A list, uh, embrace their older, less environmentally ambitious work. For, so for me, this was proof that the architecture industry is divided between what I would call the art of architecture and the science of building. We think of sustainability as irrelevant to the things that the architectural community holds up as great. One of these is right here in your backyard. I'm on the board of directors of the Center for Maximum Potential Building Systems. It's Plenty Fisk and Gail Vittori. I, th I think Plenty was going to try to be here, but raise your hand if you're hiding back there. Probably not. So uh, the center is a national treasure. If you haven't been over there, you should go. It's an incredible place. So finally, before I jump into it, E.O. Wilson is a Harvard biologist who's mostly known for being the world's foremost expert on ants. And it's seemingly in his spare time, he tosses off these little books that completely change our thinking about sustainability. One in the 80s was called biophilia. If you, if you know that term, it's because of E.O. Wilson. One of them is this one, which if you were going to read one book on anything other than my book, it should be this one, Consilience. Uh, the subtitle is The Unity of Knowledge. And it's basically this, that the, we think the idea that the arts and the sciences are separate is a modern conceit. Before Descartes, we thought of them as the same thing. And what Wilson says is until we bridge the divide between them, our relationship with the earth will remain challenged. So what are the implications within the design industry for bridging the gap between art and science? How do we make them one and the same? How do we make sustainability and beauty one and the same? So it's not, our challenge is not just to make high performing buildings attractive, it's to erase the difference between sustainability and beauty. So I divide the book into three themes, three kinds of shape, it's called the shape of green, and there are ways of testing this idea of bridging the gap between sustainability and beauty. They are conservation, attraction, and connection. Shape for economy, how do we conserve resources just through the basic napkin sketch level of design. Shape for pleasure, how do we draw from new research, emerging research over the last decade or two into neuroscience and environmental psychology to understand better the me mechanics of attraction. So we're not just making it up. I like blue, you like purple, how do we resolve that? How do we figure out whether blue or purple is smarter for people to get them to embrace something? And finally, connection, how do we shape things to be more appropriate to a given place? 
So, conservation. Emerson, in his famous essay on beauty, said that the line of beauty is the result of perfect economy. He looks at things like honeycombs and the quills of bird feathers and shows that much of nature is using resources very smartly, and the way it does that, we consider to be beautiful. Now, that's not the way we design things, typically. So, if I asked you to pick which one of these cars is green, can anybody pick it out? One of them is the 2010 Honda Civic Hybrid, and the other one is the 2010 conventional Honda Civic. Can you tell the difference? There is no difference. They have exactly the same body design. Uh, one has a hybrid engine, one has a conventional engine, and that's it. So for me, it is a perfect metaphor for how designers approach sustainability, because performance is hidden under the hood, right? We think of buildings in the same way. Sustainability is something that lives in a technical manual. It's in the mechanical systems. It's in material choices, insulation, that sort of thing, glazing. It's not in the kinds of things that you would sketch on a napkin. By contrast, uh, I lived in Charlottesville, Virginia for about 15 years. And in 2006, I was the first person in Charlottesville to have a smart car. It was one of the first generation smart cars, which is smaller and lighter than the domestics. So it, it gets better fuel economy. So it has a regular three-cylinder gas engine, but just because it's small, round, light, and compact, it gets better mileage than most of the American hybrids. It also, uh, for me, this is a good example of how design trumps technology. A smart mechanical engineer will tell you if the, you made stupid decisions about the design of a building before he or she arrived on the project, the most he or she can hope to do is make up for your stupid decisions. So we can't rely just on the engineers to, to make it green, right? Plus, uh, everywhere I go, people turn and smile, so I like to think I'm spreading joy through the land. <laughs> and I, actually, when I rent a car and I drive around, people don't grin. I wonder, what's going on? Oh, it's the car. So other examples of this, the uh, Japanese bullet train, they were having troubles with, uh, trouble with a sonic boom that was going so fast it would create this exploding noise. So they looked at, at nature and how nature designs things that move really fast through barriers such as water. And, pattern the nose cone after the kingfisher beak. With kingfisher has to be able to penetrate the surface of water without scaring fish away. So, and in doing so, it could go 10% faster with 15% less energy, no sonic boom. Similar example, a Daimler Chrysler, their concept car from a few years ago, they call their bionic car for no explained reason. They patterned after the box fish. It looks really big on the screen, but it's actually about that big. You wouldn't know it from looking at it because it's kind of bulbous, but it's the most, uh, from a fluid dynamic standpoint, it's the most efficient fish in the ocean. And it darts around uh, in the eddies and swirls of a coral reef, so it has to be able to uh, remain buoyant. So they pattern the, the chassis of the bionic car after this, and it gets 84 miles per gallon with a regular diesel engine. That's much better than most of the American hybrids. So all this is to say that there is a relationship between form and performance. Now, if you look in the design industry, there are three kinds of buildings. Most of the ones that are celebrated, most of the ones that the most famous architects practice are a good form, they're compelling form, with bad performance. Zaha lives in that, that realm, right? The other end of the spectrum is buildings like this that have really smart systems great insulation, et cetera, et cetera, perform a little better, but I think it's safe to say that they're not exactly gonna put a skip in your step. What we're targeting is this sweet spot in the middle where form and performance come together. So a good example of that would be Foster City Hall in London. It leans into the sun, so it's self-shading. It minimizes the profile to the hottest side. And uh, it's serrated, so it's even more self-shading. It also leans away from the public uh, walk along the river here in order to create more of a public space. As a result, it uses about 25% of the energy of a typical European office building, simply because of this shape, right? A good another good example, this is being touted as the most energy efficient office building in Europe, Sauber Cotton in uh, Frankfurt. The, uh, it's a west-facing facade, which if you've, if you've steeped yourself in the practice of sustainable design is is a terrible thing, right? It gets really hot in the afternoon. So they've created this podium, and then this airfoil-like shape, uh, the tower rises out of that, 
So it minimizes the profile to the hottest time of the day and also conveys wind around it to, uh, to be more conducive to passive ventilation. As a result, it saves about 75, 70% of energy. We've been toying with these kinds of things the last year or two. We do a lot of this kind of work in China, very tall towers. We're looking at shaping this. If you know anything about tall towers, the operative condition is wind loads. You go really tall and the wind is just slamming. Usually, traditionally, the way that's dealt with is you heavy up the structure just to withstand the, the wind. But the way nature deals with that is to create, if you think about a reed on a riverbed, it's more flexible, right? It's not putting more material on it. It's just creating shapes that work more elegantly with the wind. That's what this does. So it creates this shape that will convey the wind around, but actually you don't want it, it shouldn't act like a, an airplane wing. It should break up the wind as it moves around, which accounts for these serrations here, right? Those serrations are also where we put photovoltaics to create the net zero. So I call this self-sustaining form. There are actually a lot of examples from the history of architecture who do this kind of thing. It's just not what we tend to focus on. Again, I lived in Charlottesville for a long time. Thomas Jefferson is God there. So if you know the University of Virginia campus, or grounds as they call it there, um, it's mostly, it's considered by architects, it's always in their top 10 or 15 list of great American examples of architecture. And it is mostly, every single part of it is derivative of French neoclassical architecture because Jefferson loved France, right? Except for these famous serpentine walls. Now, one thing you might know, not know about Jefferson, but you'd learn it if you visit Monticello, his home there, uh, he was not very good with money. So, for instance, the Library of Congress was founded because he needed to raise money to pay off his debts, so he sold his books to Congress, and that's what established the Library of Congress. Same thing happened here. They were building the University of Virginia. They ran out of money for bricks, and he had to come up with a smart way to use what little brick they had to build these walls. So the story goes. So typically the way you do a wall like this is two layers of brick so it won't fall over. So by undulating it like this, he could use just one layer of brick because it stabilizes itself, right? What I love about this is it's one of those rare examples from quote unquote high architecture where an architect who normally is accustomed to having plenty of resources is forced to innovate because of a lack of resources, which is more how traditional peoples deal with materials, right? So this is the one thing on that campus that isn't derivative of European precedent. And the only reason it's not is because he was forced to innovate because of a lack of resources. So other examples, this is my favorite recent one. You think of something like a pot that you put on to you know, boil water as being, well, that's the way, there was no other way to do that, right? That's the way we've done it forever. Well, recently, these pots, they started serrating the edge. It has this sort of undulated plan. And what it does is it funnels the heat up through these channels here. And you can see from the comparison that this it gets hotter much more quickly with less energy than a typical pot. I love this because it's innovation looking at the most mundane of designs, and you can see it right there on the surface. A really great example of this from architecture is, you may know Mark West, so he teaches at the University of Manitoba. He and his students have been uh, playing a lot with fabric formwork. So concrete will take virtually any shape you give it, but we tend to build little boxes out of plywood or fiberglass or something. We'll pour in a fluid material which hardens, then we tear off the formwork, and what's left over is a box-shaped piece of concrete, right? So what's interesting is if you look at any building, the structure is either is typically going to be concrete, metal, or wood, and we tend to choose those materials and beams and columns by looking at the so-called worst case scenario. A beam spans from there to there, and it has to be about that deep in one place, so we make it that deep all the way across the length. So virtually every building ever built uses about twice the amount of materials it needs in structure, only because we don't know how to shape the material differently. In this case, they're putting concrete only where it's needed because they're using textiles and sewing it like a dress. So they're taking, raise your hand if you have taken structures yet. When I mention the phrase moment diagram, you see this Pavlovian fear run across architects' eyes because you know, they think of a lot of sleepless nights. So a moment diagram is basically just tracing the, the, the physical forces running through a structural member, right? All this does is take the moment diagram and build it. 
So it puts concrete only where it's needed, saving about half the amount of material, 300 times the weight of, of the formwork, and what's left over is this incredibly graceful, porpoise-shaped thing. Now, imagine if we applied that kind of ingenuity to every aspect of a building, columns, beams, doors, windows, walls, roofs. What would result when we stop living in boxes and cages and start to occupy something that feels more like natural things? Right? So this is something like we think, you know, there's not a lot to innovate in architecture yet. This is one of the most common everyday examples of what we do, what we build, a concrete beam, and there's still a lot of work to do to try to innovate. And it's also a great example of bridging the gap between the science and art of architecture. All right, so that's shape for conservation. The second principle is attraction. So uh, Keats said, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Um, now, you often hear when you study sustainable design, you hear that it's, it's meant to be both responsible for nature, and it's also one of the goals is design that behaves more like nature. I give you examples like fish and birds and reeds on a riverbed, right? So it begs the question, what is nature like? So I took this photo in the Sierra Nevadas in, the, in an aspen grove a few years ago during that really brief time in autumn when they look like this. It's like walking into a three-dimensional sunset. Now, a conventional view of sustainability would ask, what, would, what can we learn from this? And it might look at this scene and think, my, look at all the chlorophyll ebbing from the leaves, and therefore it's losing its ability to sequester carbon and produce oxygen, et cetera, et cetera, right? A human response to this is emotional. It's basically it, you stop breathing because it's so beautiful. So in other words, if we're, going to, if we're going to create designs that behave more like nature, the first order of business is to knock your socks off. Now, unfortunately, sustainable design has a reputation for keeping your socks decidedly intact. <laughs> This is the first lead platinum building in the Middle East, and it won an award a few years ago as the most intelligent building in the world, and by many measures it is. Its systems are incredibly smart in how it automatically adjusts to uh, different conditions, right? But I think it's safe to say that it's not exactly inspired architecture, a sort of black glass hockey puck that fell out of the sky in a very hot desert doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So, and it's buildings like this that have given the whole agenda a bad reputation to make people like Peter Eisenman dismiss it. So, uh, why is it important to create things that knock your socks off? Well, this is, in a nutshell, my favorite quote to explain that. There's a Senegalese poet who says, in the end, we conserve only what we love. We're not, we don't love things that are biodegradable and energy efficient. We love things that move the head and heart, right? You, the theory being that if you create something that people enjoy and love and cherish, they'll never get rid of it. Historic preservation relies on this. Great buildings we try to keep for a long time, and the so-called embodied energy that is represented by a building becomes smaller and smaller and smaller over time the longer we embrace something. And yet, we tend to build buildings today that last 20 years of that, and then we tear them down, because they're not exactly the most inspired places. So, um, again, what is, this kind of begs the question, if, if we're trying to create things that people will love, increase the likelihood that people will cherish them, then we have to know what it is that people love. Are we just making it up? Or do we have some clear understanding of that? People tend to like babies. If you've had a Psych 101 course, you might know Conrad Lawrence's famous studies, basically showing that people tend to embrace things that remind them of babies. Big eyes, rounded proportions, etc. So Japanese anime relies on this. The reason why it's a multi-million dollar industry is because everything looks like a baby. <laughs> um, I think it's also why people like the smart car. It's like driving around a big baby head. Um, people also tend to like puppies. So when the v new VW Beetle, the new Beetle, came out in the late 90s, it was, the media called it the most smile-inducing car on the road for decades. It's a regular-sized sedan, but it has the proportions of a puppy. It's got the eyes, it's got the puppy-like proportions, right? So by the way, someone gave me advice once, look, whenever you give a public talk, show either a baby or a puppy, and you'll have the audience eating out of your hand. So I've shown you a baby and a puppy, so I'm doubly manipulating. <laughs> also, at UVA, coincidentally, a couple years ago, did the, the study where they wanted to understand why uh, 
videos on YouTube that, of kittens falling asleep, or you've probably seen the one of the baby goat knocking over the other baby goats, right? You've know, already seen that one, it's adorable. They were trying to understand why those kinds of videos get a billion hits every, every year, as opposed to something, you know, maybe more substantive. So what they did is they did a controlled study where they asked two groups to take uh, tests of their motor skills and their mental aptitude, and they showed one of the groups videos of things like baby goats knocking each other over before they took the test. And what they found is by huge margins, they scored better on these tests after watching kittens fall asleep. And the theory is that it brings out the caretaker in us and it makes us feel more comfortable, reduces stress, we feel more relaxed, right? So there's something happening psychologically to us when we see things that make us feel comfortable like this, right? So now, what is the lesson there? Do we want all things like buildings to look like babies or puppies? No. But do we want to understand more about the science of human response, emotional response, to certain kinds of shapes, colors, patterns? Yes. And we know virtually nothing about those things. We don't study it. A lot of what we know about it has just emerged in recent years, so it hasn't worked its way into design schools yet, right? I don't, you know, color is a huge topic, and there are very few architecture schools that require a course on color theory. And then people don't understand why architects tend to make white and gray buildings, because we're afraid of color. We know nothing about it. We choose color just purely out of instinct. We know nothing about the science of color, as one example. So I'm not going to belabor all this, but I think it's one of the more important parts of the book. If you want a quick synopsis of all this, I wrote an article last year in the New York Times that's on a lot of what I'm about to talk to you about, but I'm going to pick one example. Um, there are, there's a lot in both the article and the book on how different kinds of shapes, colors, and patterns that more and more research has shown leads to a certain kind of response in people. I'm going to look at just one pattern. So uh, in Japan, there's something called forest bathing that is incredibly popular, and they've shown that if you wander around in, in places like this, they will do skin conductance tests and heart rate monitors to show that it really it lowers your stress significantly. So we're drawn to this. Why is that? Is it because there are some invisible pheromones or chemicals emitting that make us feel like we're drugged or something? No, it's just purely about what it looks like, what it feels like. Well, what do we do as designers? We we dwell in the realm of looking and feeling, right? How what do we learn from that and bring it into a building? So we know that that kind of scene is what draws tourists and makes people feel good, and then we build rooms like this that feel completely different. Why is that? I don't know. Um, so now lots and lots of emerging research shows that one of the things that attracts us to that kind of scene is the pattern known as natural fractals. Does that ring a bell to anybody, fractals? So when you say the word fractal, most people think of the computer-generated Paisley-like images. They look very mechanical because they are. They are self-identical at every scale. So if you look at it this big and then zoom in, it's perfectly identical, so it looks a little robotronic. Natural fractals, like trees, are self-similar at different scales. So they're a little more resilient, and they also have a little more looseness. So those are not identical images, but they're very similar. A tree looks very similar at different scales. And we are drawn to that. Lots of theories why. One of the theories is that it's, it's the, the human animal. We spent 90% of our biological history in the African savanna before we migrated away. So it stands to reason that the body and the brain and the eye and all our senses developed for a specific kind of environment. And everywhere we've gone, as the theory goes, we seek out those same kinds of visual, spatial, and environmental cues. So if, if people tend to be drawn towards places with rolling hills, stands of water, clumps of trees, we don't like vast open spaces like the Sahara. We don't want to live there. We don't like really dense forests. We want places that have a little bit of a view and have a certain kind of feeling. Golf courses feel like that, Japanese gardens. All the places where the rich and powerful are uh, drawn to because they have the means to go anywhere they want tend to look the same. It's bodies of water, it's halfway up the hill, etc. Part of the theory behind all this is this fractal thing. There's a physicist in Seattle named Richard Taylor who studies all of this and shows that there's this optimal density of fractals that looks like that. This is completely dense and scary. 
If you've read uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, you remember the forest was the evil place for Puritans, right? That feels like the open ocean of the Sahara. We tend to like that. We're drawn to that. And what Taylor shows is he's done these tests, and he's shown that when people are exposed to this kind of a pattern, it's just in their field of vision, it lowers stress by as much as 60% just by being in review. So there are a couple of things that are revolutionary about this. One is that abstract design, just by, by being smart about how we tweak the patterns, can have a medicinal effect on people by lowering stress. The other is, as Taylor estimates, in this country alone we spend about $300 billion a year dealing with stress-related illness. Now what if we could create environments like this room that would have the stress-lowering effect? It could be worth close to $200 billion a year. So this isn't fluff. This is, actually has a direct impact on the bottom line. Taylor has been working on a, a book about Jackson Pollock, and he shows that in, in Jackson Pollock's uh, mature phase, uh, in 1949, uh, he was painting canvases like this when Life magazine called him the greatest American living painter. And Taylor has shown that this pattern is the optimal fractal pattern. Right? So his theory is that you've seen all the images and videos of Jackson Pollock you know, flinging drips and drabs of paint on canvas. The theory is that over decades he was excavating this image we all have buried in our genetic memory of this sort of optimal pattern. And he took years and years and years to refine it and he got, at the time when he was labeled a genius, he had stumbled onto this optimal density. Now art is one thing, pure art like a painting or a sculpture or a poem. But in design, now if, imagine if you understood the science of this, we could get to these smarter solutions more quickly so we don't have to spend an entire career, an entire lifetime trying to find them. There are a lot of architects today playing with irregular patterns. This is Jean Nouvel's Louvre in Abu Dhabi. I talked to Nouvel's office and they've never heard of any of this research around fractals and yet they're drawn to these things. Now what would happen if somebody like Nouvel's office understood all the science of this, what, could they subtly tweak these patterns and have a much more substantial impact than they really are. Other people were playing with these things in subtler ways. This is Cook and Fox. Uh, they did this prefab house where they're looking at perforated patterns that mimic the sort of dappled light of porous. And in our office, uh, actually our Dallas office, did this sort of, um, we're playing with digital fabrication in this um, sort of uh, modular uh, brisa pattern that was trying to look at the fractal density so that not only could it control light and reduce heat gain, it could also create an image as you look through a window that might be more pleasing. All right, that's shape for conservation, shape for attraction. The last is shape for connection. So what's appropriate for a given place? From that same essay of Emerson, he says, nothing is quite beautiful alone. We tend to think of design as, as objects. Even buildings we sort of conceive as objects rather than being in a context. Now, if you look at nature, we say we're designing for nature, even within sustainable design. You look at nature and you have this rich bounty of incredibly beautiful places, uh, and a lot of variety. It's a tapestry that just seems endless. And what we give back to nature looks more like this. I have no idea where this is. I just Googled McMansion and this is what came up. This could be anywhere, really. It could be in Botswana. It could be here in Austin. It doesn't really matter. We, we build the same things everywhere. Now, uh, this is a map of McDonald's. Every country in the world seven years ago that had a significant presence of McDonald's. And uh, this is an actual photograph. It's the Golden Arches next to an ancient Egyptian temple, right? We are losing the difference between one place and another because we've given over the public realm to these forces that create the same images, the same buildings everywhere they go. Now, the, if you follow this out, by next year, McDonald's will have a significant presence everywhere. McDonald's is the single largest owner of retail space in the world, and you may know, you may not know, that the Golden Arches are the single most widely recognized symbol on Earth. More people recognize the Golden Arches than recognize the Christian cross. That's what we've done to public space. We've given it over to symbolism and spatial forces that have nothing to do with what's right for a place and have everything to do with selling hamburgers. <laughs>
Uh, Vandana Shiva wrote an amazing book called The Earth Democracy. She talks about globalization and its effects on culture. And she says, globalization is basically hijacked culture, tur turning it in, into a consumerist monoculture of Coca-Cola and McDonald's. Now, here's the funny thing. Architects like me, we like to blast McDonald's for building the same building everywhere, and yet we give awards to Frank Gehry for doing the same thing. <laughs> Why is that? We, in fact, not only, it's not, in fact, I'll go one step further. We tend to think of the most celebrated architects as having maturity if they build the same thing everywhere. There are a lot of architects who have been considered to be immature because they don't have this consistent vocabulary. Eero Saarinen was criticized for not building the same building everywhere, right? Um, so why is it that we think that Frank Gehry is somehow brilliant because he keeps building the same building everywhere? It's no different than McDonald's, it's just expensive, right? And it wins awards. Um, so, and, but this is what we hold up. We think, uh, remember I mentioned at the beginning that the architecture industry tends to think of geniuses coming from uh, single visionaries rather than a collective like this. There's much more intellectual power in this room than there is in that head, and yet we hold her up as somehow being different from the rest of us mere mortals. Angels descend from heaven and whisper secrets in her ear that the rest of us don't have. We think of that as being design genius. We don't think of great design as something that we can get to just by diligent practice and study and understanding what good design is. We think it, it's, it comes from lightning bolts, right? So this is a huge problem, and here's why. Because we tend to think of a signature style as being the most important thing with a great architect. But I would argue that signature style is the single biggest obstacle to sustainable performance. Why? Because if you have a preconceived notion about how a building is meant to be shaped, it's going to look like that or that or that before you go into it. You don't even know where you're going to be building and who for tomorrow, but you know it's going to look like that. You can't allow the building to evolve the way it needs to evolve to become what it, what's best for these people in this place, right? You hire Frank Gehry because you want the same thing. You don't hire, hire Frank Gehry because he's going to do the right thing for you. And yet, we've given over the entire industry. You saw the list from Vanity Fair, right? That's what we think great design is. And that's why I think if we really embrace the principles of sustainability, it's not just that we save a little uh, on energy and emissions, it completely upturns all our values in the design industry. It's revolutionary. And I don't hear anybody talking about this. We tend to think of it as something we sort of shoehorn into a building after we figure out what it looks like. We're also told that form follows function. You know that phrase, it's Louis Sullivan. Uh, what he meant by function was program. What is the building meant to be used for? An office building looks like an office building looks like an office building. We hold a functionalism as being great. But that's not what indigenous and vernacular architecture does. So here's the same function, the same use, a single family house. One's in, what? One's in Virginia, here, the dog trot, and one's in New England. So here, the operative condition is it gets really hot and humid in summer. So you keep the building low deep overhang, spread it out, big hole in the middle to promote breezes. So lots, the surface to volume ratio is pretty uh, high, right? Lots of surface area to promote breezes. Here it's the opposite. It gets really cold in the winter, so you want it really compact. Surface to volume ratio is really low. Very small openings, big hearth in the middle. You're trying to conserve heat, here you're trying to get rid of heat. Same function, different forms. Form does not follow function. And yet, we are taught from day one in architecture school that this is one of the great things. This is what I mean, if you really want to pursue sustainability, it completely changes all the values of our industry. So there isn't a lot of great contemporary architecture that I think represents all three of these principles sort of thrown into a soup together. Some of Piano's work does it. You know this building. Uh, he's looking at, whoops. Um, He's looking at these kinds of constructions in that area, but also combining them with the idea of a thermal flu to draw heat up out of these areas. So it feels appropriate to this place, but also performs better. This is one of our buildings. We do a lot of work in Dubai. Everybody does a lot of work in Dubai. Dubai is a completely unnatural place. It's like Las Vegas on steroids. So you can either decide, well, I'm not going to build there because I don't want to be part of the problem, or you can try to do something better there. 
So now building towers in the middle of the desert on the edge of the ocean is not a natural thing to do. There is no precedent. There's no uh, indigenous architecture from that area that goes high because it all sit, stays low. And yet most of what's being built there are these sort of prismatic glass towers that look as if they could be anywhere. So we wanted to try something different. We looked at two precedents from the area. One is natural. The date palm tree has these deeply sort of serrated, uh, this bark, so it's self-shading. And then the Mashrabia uh, porch is, ha, ha, has this sort of dappled light, but also allows breezes to go through. Combining those two things in this um, shaded structure, we calculated that we could save about 25% on energy just through this, without looking at what we're doing with glazing and, and mechanical systems and such. All right, finally, this is the last slide, so bear with me. Um, I, um, there, I think there are two strains of architectural history. One of them we're very familiar with, the other one we're not very familiar with. And this is the one we're very familiar with. If you look at, I, I haven't picked up a, a recent book on the history of world architecture, but when I was in school 90 years ago, with Juan and these guys, uh, because we're ancient. Um, if you open up something like Bannister Fletcher, it's a, basically a chronicle of the rich and famous. It's uh, monuments of architecture. There's very little in there about uh, housing for the poor and such. The second thing that you notice about it is up until the Renaissance, it's all sacred space. It's temples, churches, cathedrals, mausoleums, etc. right? Because that's what the monuments were. Up until the Renaissance, when people started embracing humanism, great architecture was monuments to faith of some kind. So from day one, we're taught that great architecture are these monuments to sacred space. Now the interesting thing is, in the West, in Western faith traditions, those kinds of places are meant to be, this is the phrase you hear, a place of heart. It's meant to be something out of ordinary experience. The Parthenon was not something that people could just enter into. Only the priests could go in there. It's this sort of arduous path to get up there. And in fact, there's this amazing book called Socrates' Ancestor that's looking at uh, the evolution of the Doric Temple. And, and she shows that all the language they use, like the peristyle, peri, peri uh, that word comes from a word meaning wings. It's meant to look as if it could just take off, like a bird perched on an outcropping, right? It's meant to be seen as not part of your environment. So, and then, you know, you look at, so all architects are taught the great architecture does that. It's not part of this place. It's something separate, like it could just sort of float away. And contemporary architecture that we hold up as great monuments, like the Minneapolis Art Museum, Kawatrava, is exactly the same. It literally tries to take off, right? So there's this whole, what we're taught when we're 18, it is great architecture of these monuments that are meant to be seen as separate from their environments. And then we wonder why architecture seems separate from its environment and doesn't necessarily respect its environment. There's this whole hidden history of architecture that at least when I was in school, we were not taught. And it's a very different attitude towards place, a part of place rather than a place of part. If you look at indigenous and vernacular st structures, first of all, there are places where people lived in, in a place, understood the land, understood the climate over many, many generations. The igloo was not invented by one genius Eskimo. It's a testament to the enduring wisdom of the Inuit people living in that place, being forced to innovate, right, constantly. That's how these places evolve. And just squint your eyes, look at that. All these look pretty much the same from you know, ancient Greece through today. Now look at that. They all look as if they're blurring the lines between building and land. They feel very much not just a part of that place. It feels as if there is no distinction between the place and the building, right? So if we're looking for a new paradigm for architecture in the age of sustainability, that's the wrong history to look at. This is the right history to look at because this is a better model for what we're doing than that. So one of the myths of, in the green building community is that sustainability has to cost more. These are the poorest people who have ever lived, right? And they figured it out, so why can't we? Thank you.